Welcome to Perfectly Imperfect with Beautiful Disaster. These are the stories of our tribe. They are important, powerful, and will undoubtedly change you. All right, we are recording, and then we're going to go live, and I will introduce you to the tribe. There might be a couple little things I have to do quickly before we go live. So we are going to share this on a page I manage, which is Beautiful Disaster Clothing. <laughs> Hit next. Okay, it's preparing the live stream. And I'm going to add a title. Let's see, what title do I want? What's, what's your kind of, what was the title of your um, TED talk? Uh, the brain and family addiction. Uh, my book was growing up old, child of an addict. Um, so I'm going to do addiction in the family. Yeah. Um, I'll just do a title addiction in the family. Okay. And live with. See, I never had to do all of this on the spot. <laughs> Let's, and I, I know there's a little bit of a delay, hopefully not for us. I don't think between you and I, I think, I think we're good. Yeah, I think only on the live. Okay, so here we go. Live with Dr. Melissa Veda, author and TED Talk speaker, and then I'll do the full. We're going to go live. Setting up your meeting for Facebook Live. So I think here in a moment we will be live on Facebook. And we are. We are officially live on Facebook. So I would love to formally introduce our guests today. Uh, we are so honored to have Dr. Melissa Veda who is an author, a TED Talk speaker, and founder of the Addiction Foundation, which is dedicated to providing education and support for individuals who love someone with an addiction, and to developing sustainable addiction recovery solutions for addicts through support for effective long-term sober living plans. So Dr. Melissa Veda, thank you so much for joining the beautiful disaster tribe today to talk to us about this very important topic. We're just so glad to have you. Thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're so welcome. Um, you know, I had the pleasure of watching your TED talk and going down the rabbit hole of all the different articles <laughs> you've been in and I visited your website and, you know, I know a bit about your upbringing and your story, um, but I would love for you to share with the tribe, if you can kind of take us back, um, you know, to what it was like being the daughter of a mother uh, that was an addict, and then um, we'll get into some of the work that you're doing. Sure, absolutely. Um, I think one of the more interesting things about my story is that by all outward appearances, no one really would have ever known that anything was going on behind closed doors. And I now know that I've taken a look at all of this, that this is a really common theme for many individuals who love someone with an addiction. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, really as small children, we tend to try to um, take it upon ourselves and take care of the individual and maintain appearances, cover for them. Right. Um, and, and often, you know, I would um, explain my mother as a functional addict for long periods of time um, and then it was until she eventually wasn't a functional addict she had a job she paid bills she made dinner she was a mom right and then she was gone 
literally and figuratively. I mean, I would wait it out. I'd take care of myself, the house, my sister. I'd make excuses and I would just kind of pray that it wouldn't last too long. Mm -hmm. um, and this was the cycle. It would just go up and down. And so um, unfortunately, it was one of those things that was kind of easy to hide because mm -hmm. it was a cycle. You could get through it. Um, and I tried really hard to understand what was happening, even as a young child. I tried to help her. I tried to fix everything. Right. I, I tried to make everything as right as I could, even, even as a very young child. And there are some, you know, things that I went through as a child that I really, quite honestly, can't tell you why I'm here today. I, it's hard to understand. Um, and the only thing I can think of is that it's because I'm supposed to carry this on in some way sure. and share how you travel through it. Right. Um, and so I don't want to talk about too much of the, the tragedy aspect of it, um, because that has been a very long journey. And I think everyone's journey is a little bit different. But I think that we all experience things in different ways. And one of the bigger lessons I've learned really is all about not knowing what you don't know about a person and their life. Sure, sure. So um, just so we can connect the dots a little bit, was, was this something that you experienced your whole life? Was your mom an addict from day one? Yes, yes. Okay. I mean, you know, I would say that as a younger child, I wasn't something that I would characterize that way because that I didn't know any different. Sure. Um, but as I got older, I certainly understood that this was an ongoing problem for her entire life. It probably um, was something that affected her even in her, her childhood or very young adulthood. Wow, wow. Yes. Well, um, I too am the child of uh, an alcoholic drug addict, and he passed away at 44 years of age. He did get the opportunity to get clean and sober, um, but I wasn't a part of his life for, you know, 16 of the 18 years. He died when I was uh, 18 years old. So, um, you know, I think that this is a topic that I would be hard pressed to say that not, uh, that everybody can relate to. I, I think, Either we have had a sibling or a parent that struggled with addiction or a loved one of some kind, a friend, a boyfriend. I mean, there's, there's just not very many people walking around that haven't been affected uh, by an addict in some way, shape, or form. So when did you make the switch? When did you become so aware of it that you actually started doing something about about it tell us about that sure sure i think that you know as a younger child i didn't question what was going on but when i got older i really began to realize that what was going on in our lives just wasn't normal i, I became the parent and she became the child mm -hmm. and i it was probably around the time that i was in college that i realized how negatively my life has has been impacted by the relationship that i had with her and i certainly throughout high school um, i was trying to find my way and figure out um, how I was supposed to survive with all of this going on, but mostly what I did was I kept my head down. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell anybody what was going on. I worked very hard in school. I played sports. I had friends, mm -hmm. but after school or after sports, I would go home and the door would be closed and nobody would know what was happening. Right. And I had myself convinced that I could live that way and that when I got accepted to college, college was sort of my way out. Right. And I really thought that I could go to college and not turn around and look back. Okay. But it doesn't work like that. Right. It doesn't work like that. Um, it either rears its ugly head um, negatively in your relationships or in your, your self-esteem or in your sure. drive to do things or in guilt. Mm. And um, I started to realize that those were things that were pulling on me, and it was probably not until I was out of college that I actually sought the help that I needed through um, counseling or some, you know, something along those lines. But in between that period of time and actually seeking professional help, I delved into research and tried to understand addiction. Um, comorbid comorbidity, you know, any type of depression that's associated with addiction, sure. um, you know,
know, what's the chicken and the egg? How, how, how do they become paired so closely together? Um, and that's really how it started for me. I was a sociology major in college, and it was a perfect avenue for me to start to right. explore why people do what they do. Right. And I had to do that in an environment that was away from her. Sure. And that's why college was good for me. And so I would say that it wasn't until after college that I realized that I needed to do something to fix myself. Otherwise, the rest of my life would be um, spent in this cycle of helping her, being angry with her, helping her, hating her, loving right. her, right. Uh, and really getting lost in it. Right, right. So uh, you you went on to do, I'm sure, years and years and years of schooling. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about um, your schooling, you know, um, how many years, where you went, the degrees that you got, and, and kind of, you know, just qualify yourself for us and the audience. Oh, sure, sure. So I did undergraduate work at Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and I was a sociology and American studies major there. Um, and then I went on to graduate school and looked at uh, American studies in the family, and that was my major there. And a lot of that had to do with what um, we call social constructions. You know, we construct these things in our society, either crime or addiction or, um, you know, financial problems that we that fit into our world and we give them a definition. And right. so that that was one thing that attracted me to that major. Um, I went on and also got my um, my MBA. And then my final degree is a doctorate in education in leadership. And those things really built on each other over time, because I think, like I said, we don't know what is going on in the lives of every person we interact with, whether they are your neighbor or your employee. And to have that kind of insight to be able to try and understand that with each person you interact with has helped me professionally in my career. Um, but I've also been able to do, continue to do research and writing and have, you know, an outlet to speak about the things that I care tremendously about. Um, and that's in addition to my career. It's sort of above and beyond those sort of things. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to do that. Yeah, we um, we actually have a collection at Beautiful Disaster. I don't know if you saw it. I see that you're wearing your uh, beautifully yeah. broken shirt. Thank <laughs> you for that. We have a collection that's called "You Don't Know My Story." Right. Uh huh. Exactly. So it's it's very much uh, tied into what you just said about you know we we really don't. You don't know my story. I don't know your story. You know we're getting to learn a little bit of each other's stories right now, but we definitely live in a world where. There's so much judgment, especially with social media and being so much more exposed than we've ever been before. But, you know, we all choose what to expose. That doesn't mean that you're really telling your story. So um, I can definitely appreciate that point. Um, how did it feel having so much responsibility as a child, trying to take care of everything while you know, going, going through this journey, I guess what I'm leading up to is it's almost like your, your curse was your gift. Mm. Like you had to manage this life and then you ended up using it, you know, to better your life. So just what was it like managing all of that, taking care of your siblings, being the mom, you know, what was that like? Yeah. Uh, the best way I can explain it is that it was a roller coaster of emotions, and those emotions were typically, you know, aimed at my mother. I was desperate. I, I, I had love for her. I hated her. I had anger. I was afraid. Wow. Uh, you name it. And that made me isolate myself and just focus. I was hyper focused on things. And I, that's a positive and a negative. I mean, it's one of the things I write about in, in uh, my book and in one of my articles it made me strong. It made me who I am. Right. And those are positive things, but those same things um, did negative things to me, made me doubt relationships, made me not have faith in people, made, you yeah. know, a whole bunch of other things. And um, I'd vacillate between hating myself for hating her yeah. and wanting to abandon her uh, to feeling guilty and then scooping her up and paying her bills and bailing yeah. her out. And, sure. 
you know, thinking that I could love her enough to fix her. Right. And I really wanted so badly for her to do it for me. Um, and that was an impossible cycle to be in. And eventually, you know, you realize, um, I don't know how far down or how far sad or broken we have to get to reach that point. Um, but fortunately, I did. I mean, I fortunately uh, reached that point where I could understand and accept certain things about the disease that uh, allowed it to sit okay with me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and I was able to sort of um, come to, you know, a peace with the fact that sometimes I would hate her, but I was always going to fier fiercely love her. Right. Um, and, and that's a really strange place to be in. Sure. Absolutely. Do you remember the moment or, or the season, if you will, when you just got hyper-focused on figuring out why she was an addict, because that, that had to be where this all started. You know, you were having this experience and you must have been at some point obsessed with why. I, you know, I was, I was for a long time. Um, and I, I think that that happened in stages throughout my life, but I would say I became very focused on it uh, when I was uh, planning on getting married for the first time and, you know, thinking about children and mm. wondering what I was going to do with this when I finally had a family. Right. Um, and that became incredibly important to me because, uh, you know, I was reading and learning and I learned about um, you know, the, the predisposition of individuals that have family members with addictions and what does that mean for me uh, and being afraid. I, you know, there is, uh, a, you know, truth to the fact that it terrifies you. Sure. I, I did not have a ticking time bomb. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I was so literally afraid of drugs or alcohol that I did not have one drink of alcohol until I was 25 years old mm -hmm. and how irrational that thought is to me now today. But it was like the only thing I thought would prevent me from going down that path. Sure. Um, and so I think it was about the time that I was planning on graduating from my undergraduate program. Was and I have to figure out it, what it means to me in my life moving forward because my mom won't be here forever, but mm -hmm. I have a long life to live and I better make sure I know where I'm going with this. And honestly, it was the thought of having a family of my own right. and not, not wanting to um, replicate the life that I had experienced as a child. Right, right. So um, you've used the term disease a couple of times now. And um, I, I know personally from spending some times in some time in the rooms of um, not Alcoholics Anonymous, the one you go to when you love somebody who's an alcoholic. Sure, sure. Al-Anon? Al-Anon. Al -Anon. Mm -hmm. That, um, that's where I became familiar with that term, that alcoholism uh, was a disease. It's something that I think is um, talked about in most of the rooms of AA, NA, Al-Anon, et cetera. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk about that. Um, you know, you, you call it a disease, they call it a disease. And I'm so curious, and I'm sure there's a lot of people listening, how, how is it a disease? Right. Right. And I think this is really what makes it very complicated. And it makes it so hard for us to understand that addiction is not about lack of willpower. Mm -hmm. um, if it were, it would be a lot easier to fix. Sure. Um, and I'm sort of going to jump to something else that we, I think we were going to talk about, um, but it's very connected to this. And it's this idea of um, genetics and being hereditary. And yeah. it's the easiest way to try and explain it. But like I said, I'm not a physician. I'm not a scientist. My doctorate is in education. Right. So when I speak about this, I try to talk about it in ways that are easy to understand because genetics are so very very complicated. Right. And when you start talking about factors and G1 and G2 and HDs and all of these things, people glaze over. Right. Um, but I think that most people understand that our genes are, are comprised of a combination of things from our biological relatives. Right. That our genes um, are inherited um, and we all kind of, it's luck of the draw, which ones we get right. they are coming from our relatives. And uh, genes make us 
predisposed to many diseases. And, it, and if you look at a lot of scientific information, it talks about things like heart disease, diabetes, cancer, mm -hmm. all of those things have genetic factors associated with them and have been uh, managed and treated as diseases throughout their um, time in, in our generations, at least. Right. And, it, and addiction has become known as one of those. And, you know, just like other diseases, predisposition isn't the only causal agent of diseases. Predisposition coupled with environmental factors. Sure. Kind of complete that recipe. And how things are determined um, are not always as easy as identifying a very specific gene. Mm -hmm. You know, in the um, addiction world, the genetic influence on addiction results from variations of genes that affect a protein. And that so, so so it's your it's your position that there has been identifiable science about an addiction gene. That that's correct. That's correct. It's not a specific gene. It's the variation of genes, the combinations of genes that impact protein. And the protein is what impacts the way chemicals are processed by your, your brain. So it's not identifying a single gene, mm -hmm. the combination. So yeah, I mean, there's no way you can test, do I have the addiction gene? No, but you could get a genetic outline and it could be compared to people who have been um, identified as addicts. Okay. And it would be very likely that you would have many of the same variations that they had. And, it's all and very fascinating. It is. And it, yeah. you know, it's, this is the challenge because there is still um, a lot of fluctuation about what people believe. Is it sure. something people can control? Is it something they can't con right. control? But the protein variation really is what impacts the way the chemical is processed in your brain. And we all talk about dopamine and many people understand dopamine and pleasure receptors and serotonin. serotonin. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so it is that composition that affects those things. And it's all about your genetic compos composition. It's not identifying one gene but it is what happens to our brain. Mm. And so I see it as a disease because of those things. They are things that we are born with, that we have no control over. The aspect of it that we do have control over is our environment. And so being predisposed doesn't mean that you have a destiny of addiction. It means you, you're predisposed and you have this factor that you need to be careful about and aware of. And mm -hmm. that's, that's where I stand on it as far mm. as it being a disease. Okay. Okay. And, and I think, you know, for me, that has been really important because it has helped me understand that it's not, you can't just quit a disease. Right. Right. You can't just quit having heart disease. You can't just quit being a diabetic. It can be treated. It can be managed. There are things that you can do to try and keep it under control, mm -hmm. but it, it is can be a, prevented. Mo most of what we're talking about can be prevented. Correct. correct. And that's where it, it really gets me I get very interested in this topic because, um, you know, to anybody who's an addict or a child of an addict or afraid that they might become an addict, this word disease feels like a sentence. It does. It does. And, um, you know, I have done years and years of my own personal research, read white papers, you know, I, I've, I was very interested in why my father was an alcoholic. Um, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't have any siblings, so I don't have it to, anything to compare it to. Um, my mom's not an alcoholic, but I, I was so driven to figure out why he was an alcoholic because I thought he was choosing alcohol and drugs over me. So the theory of it being a disease, like you said, um, sometimes can make you feel a little bit better about it. Like it, it, it can give you this solace, like, okay, I wouldn't be mad at him if it was cancer. I wouldn't be resentful of him if it was diabetes, but no matter where I looked, I could not find anything to prove right. that alcoholism or addiction is a disease. But what I did find, what I was able to prove, which equally gave me the same amount of solace, was that the substances are addictive. Mm. The second you take a sip of alcohol, you are drinking an addictive chemical. So that is going to, of course, initiate addiction and the need for it in your brain. It changes the chemicals in your brain and creates the need for it. Same with nicotine, same with cocaine, heroin, et cetera. 
these substances are incredibly addicting by nature. So I vacillate also back and forth with, is it the substance or is it the person? Right. You know, so I would love to hear your thoughts on the difference of, is it the substance or is it the person? Right, right. And, and this is the argument that goes back and forth. And this yeah. is the rabbit hole that everybody goes yeah. down. And yeah. I do believe at some point you, you just have to determine for your own self where you fall on the answer. Yeah. Um, but I personally believe that, for example, a person with a drinking problem is very different from an addict. I believe that a person with a drinking problem can damage their brain and suffer many of the same consequences as an addict. Yeah. But I believe that an addict is born with that genetic variation that seeks pleasure through intoxication. Mm -hmm. And that compulsion is a little bit different. There is no doubt that the outcomes can be the same. Right. There's no doubt, right. but it's the compulsion that's different. Um, now, if you ask me, could I tell the difference between a person with a problem and a person that's an addict sitting in a room? I couldn't. Right. I, could, I couldn't do that. I, I would have to know a lot more about the situation. Sure. Yeah. To make that, you know, educate a guess. Right. But I believe that self-awareness really is your best defense when you're talking about this. If you have addiction in your family, you, you might have this greater likelihood of becoming addicted yourself. So how would we find that out? You know, just talking to, to me or the tribe yeah. or to anybody who's like, okay, this is interesting for one. And two, I, I, you know, yes, I am the child of somebody who was an addict. How would we begin to find out if we do have uh, what you call that kind of predetermined um, addiction makeup? How do we figure that out? How do you find out? Yeah, well, a lot of what the research talks about is to take a look at your family as a whole. You're not just talking about your your biological parents. You're just taught. You're talking about your your Lineage. family. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it can you know skip generations. Because like I said, it's sort of luck of the draw. Which genes we get from from whomever, and. Um, Oftentimes what we find is when we go back through the lineage, we see that there are multiple individuals that have had problems with drugs or problems with alcohol. Um, and the same can be said for things like um, um, depression or bipolar, you know, those sort of things. And that is the way that they're doing research on addiction at this point is they're trying to identify what is it that makes these modifications in the brain and how do they reach that point that they are connecting with genetics. And so I think the, the best thing that you can do is be aware of what history you have in your family um, and go beyond your parents. It can be aunts and uncles. It can be grandparents. It can be siblings. Um, you know, it can go, uh, you know, as back many, many generations. And if you, I mean, I, I did it. I took a look at what was going on in my family and I did a lot of research on it and, and asked people crazy questions. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and if I, if I stand true to that, I can say that I believe that it, existed in my family for generations and generations. Sure, sure. And you yourself did not um, grapple with addiction. I did not. Not personally, no. I grappled with the fear of addiction. Sure. <laughs> I thought no. that, I, you know, like many people, that fear of being predestined to do something mm -hmm. was what I was, I thought I was fighting. And so beginning to understand it helped me figure out, okay, well, I still have a lot of choice here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it makes me curious, you know, um, is it, so would you say that you have the ad addictive gene? I, I believe I do. Okay. So was it, so this is where it gets so interesting for me because it's, is it the fact that you have the addictive gene and you didn't trigger it? Or is it the fact that you abstained from the trigger? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I drink, uh, yeah, right. Well, I drink alcohol today. Yeah. Um, like I, today, before this? I'm <laughs> You're funny. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but you know, nerves, you know. <laughs> no, but you know, I, I, this is what I said, you know, I, I wrestled with this up until I was in my mid-20s, yeah. and I didn't have a drink of alcohol until that point in time, and right. so I understand exactly where you're coming from. That was the evolution I had to go through thought process-wise. Sure. Right. Um, and, and I think that 
what, um, what we can do is by that self-awareness, we keep tabs on ourselves. Self-awareness mm -hmm. is what prevents things from happening. Absolutely. It's just like if you know your grandmother and her mother had diabetes, you identify how you you know, can prevent it from happening in your own life. Right. And so that's the path that I took. Right. But I do believe that there was a risk there that I could have wound up like my mother or like my mother's father, um, who was also, um, he, he was an alcoholic. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so I have that same fear for my son. Right. And his children when he has them. And I, I think that for me, the process really was self-awareness. Yeah. Now, I, that that in and of itself takes self control. It does, and and it, you know it's just like taking a test and finding out you're a diabetic. Well, right. now you know you're a diabetic. That doesn't stop you from eating at McDonald's. Like right. you have to stop you from eating at McDonald's. You know everybody right. could take this test, and and if there was a test to identify an addictive gene, I'm guessing everybody has it. If you know if there was one that exists, because if you're talking about lineage, I mean going all the way back to, you know, generation and generation and generation, there's probably going to be some, some addiction there. And the only thing that can, can help you there is abstaining, you know, if we're talking about not triggering it. It's so I think you did the right thing. I mean, you were so afraid to trigger it that you just abstained and it didn't trigger. Well, I mean, people would argue for it against that, um, but uh, you know, I, I, yeah. I, it's how I felt that I needed to deal with it initially. Right. And as I gained understanding and um, the ability to look at things in different ways, I felt I could f figure out when I was safe and how to be safe. And now, and, and that's a risky road to walk down. I understand. I mean, those yeah. are things that people fight with every day. But I think that a lot of times if we are unaware, we get sucked into something that it's already too late. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. The awareness factor is critical, you know, because if you don't know, you don't know, like you said. <laughs> right. That's right. Um, but speaking of uh, recovery rooms, there's a well-known mantra in recovery rooms all around the globe, and many of us are familiar with the serenity prayer, but you have a unique story about the serenity prayer, so I'd love for you to share that uh, with us. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, ironically, it was the first prayer I ever learned as a child. I didn't know what it meant then, but for me, it takes on a different meaning. And I think that um, the first part of the serenity prayer, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. It's really become as meaningful to me as I think it has to many people in recovery, because anyone who loves someone with an addiction deserves to be released from that pain, mm -hmm. the pain that it causes, and, and needs to come to terms in some way with the simple fact that their addiction is not personal. Right. It's not about you. And, and this is where I believe science helps us. Um, I believe that addiction is rooted in science and things about science are things that I believe we can't change. We can understand them. Sure. Addiction affects brain chemistry and brain chemistry affects behavior and those behaviors deeply hurt loved ones. They right. really do. Yes. And I can't change this and, and you can't change it. You can't right. change how you felt the things that that you felt from your father's behaviors, mm -hmm. but you can accept that you can't change it. Right. And that's important. That is really, really important. And you can also um, change how you allow it to hurt yourself, how you allow it to impact you, how you deal with it. Uh, it's important, I think, to grasp what you can and can't change, sure. especially when you love an addicted person, because it totally changes your perspective. You no longer feel guilty. You um, you might be hurt, but it's not as personal as it was when you thought they were doing it to intentionally hurt you. Sure. Right. And, and so those first four lines in that prayer, they changed my life. Yeah. Um, and I, I wish that for everyone that has felt um, the pain that I have felt throughout right. this process. Right. Yeah. I, um, in, I think in one of your TED Talks or an article, I'm not exactly positive, but it was 
the way you described it, there was a story with your mom about, about the serenity prayer. Right. I, I mean, my, I would see my mom say this prayer over and over again, and she would cry. And I was little, and I had no idea. I just thought that maybe people cried when they prayed. Right. Right. <laughs> and as I began to understand it more and more, it told me she prayed that prayer because she didn't want to be an addict. Right. She couldn't fight it. Right. She just desperately, she really wanted to not be an addict. Uh, yeah. And, and that made all the difference in the world to me. Yeah, it, it really did. Absolutely. Um, you speak about four important life-changing lessons for those of us who love an addict. Um, can you share those four lessons with us? Yeah, yeah. We've, we've touched on all of them throughout okay. our conversation here today. Um, but I think that the first, the first step in my process was identifying that I do believe that it's a disease. Um, it helps me understand why they just can't quit why it's not about willpower. And that, you know, was important to me. It was important for me to begin to understand that. Right. Um, and, and I think that it was the realization that there is a genetic predisposition, the hereditary component, and knowing that it's important that if that exists in your, your lineage that you need to pay attention to it. That changed my life in mm -hmm. such a way that I wasn't as fearful as I had to be previously because right. it was something I was aware of. Right. Um, I, the other, the third one has been something we haven't talked quite as much about, but it is that I believe that addiction can be managed, you know, okay. so I do believe in levels of recovery. Um, and this is another thing that people will go back and forth on. Do they think that an addict can recover? Do they think that they can't recover? Yeah. Um, people, believe, people tend to say, you know, once an addict, always an addict. Like right. it's something that gets thrown around. Yeah. Right, right. There's probably a level of truth to that in that the danger or the risk is there. But I do believe that people can live a life in recovery. They can sustain recovery. But I think it takes everyday vigilance. Right. Kind of like a diabetic watching what they eat every day, yeah. all day long. That is how I believe addiction has to be managed in someone's life. Right. Um, so I do believe that. I don't think it's easy. Uh, and the most important one to me really has been understanding fully that their behavior isn't personal. Right. For me, it's been the most enlightening lesson. Um, an addict won't quit for you. Yeah. And an addict doesn't do it to hurt you those thoughts don't even enter their minds. Right. That drive is so powerful that reasoning has no place in their lives. And that is, you know, for us who feel as though we're rational beings and that we, we have reasons that we do things, it's very hard for us to understand it. Right. But when you can come to terms with it, it changes everything. It changes the way you feel about that person. Um, it changes the way you feel about yourself. Sure. I mean, it meant it meant many things to me, both self-esteem wise and um, the way that I uh, looked at other people as I moved forward. Right, right. I'm sure that, yeah, those those four things can definitely, uh, I don't want to say make things a little easier, but it can help put them into perspective. Yeah, I remember uh, with my father, again, going down the rabbit hole of research and that's, that's where I was always caught between, you know, is he really born this way or is it literally what he's taking is, is turning the, you know, making him addicted because he keeps taking the thing he's addicted to. Right. Uh, but I too remember uh, from Al-Anon, the serenity prayer, and it was helpful. It was absolutely helpful. Um, I remember just the thought of knowing whether he was born with it, whether it's, a disease or whether it's just the repeated use of a substance that is addictive, mm -hmm. it wasn't, uh, it wasn't my fault. Right. You know? And it definitely took some time to figure that out because early on it was how come he couldn't love me more than booze? You know, exactly. why did that always come first? You know, how come I wasn't enough? Absolutely. You know, and I think every child or relative or loved one of an addict has those same exact thoughts. So yes, it definitely brought me comfort when I learned more about alcohol and cocaine and the severity of how addictive those substances are that I was able to truly believe he didn't have control. Right. right. Which 
which meant it wasn't his fault, which meant it wasn't my fault. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. And I think that the thing that people have the most problem with in, in that journey is that we want to place blame. It'd be we easier to be someone's fault. Yeah. <laughs> right. Of course, of course. Yes. Um, I'm so curious, how is your relationship now with your mom? Yeah, well, you know, one of the most recent articles I wrote was um, about detaching with love. And so mm -hmm. I think the hardest thing to do when you love somebody um, who is an addict is to find a way to love that person that's not destructive to you as an individual. And at the same time, isn't enabling that person. And I spent a really long time throughout my entire that, adult that's, life. That's a, <laughs> that's a big one. I mean, it really is. Yeah, they call it letting go with love. And it's this yeah. really wonderful thing to say. <laughs> it, it's impossibly impossible. <laughs> right, right. So, but, I mean, we all know, have toxic people, whether they're addicts or, or not, you know how, how do you let go with love? Like, how do you really do it? I mean, I, I've got friends that struggle with parents that are just toxic and they're not even addicts. <laughs> right. So right. How right. Does one begin, you know, if you could yeah. just talk about a couple of practical mm -hmm. tools for our toolbox of right. how do you begin to do that? Uh, you know, and I really think this line is different for everyone, yeah. um, but it's exactly why I talk about this because it took a long time for me to get there. And I can't tell you 100% that I never crossed that line again. Sure. I certainly sure. did. I yeah. certainly did. But it's about creating boundaries that you can live with. I tried to cut myself off from her at right. periods of time in my life. And I felt so guilty that I couldn't handle that. Yeah, so, it's almost like a double whammy. It you really know, you, is. You yeah, feel like a horrible person. <laughs> right. It's like, well, that's not fixing anything. Right, right. I'm supposed to feel better. <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, I, I literally went down the path of, okay, this I can do this I can't do. And I, w I wrote them down. I mean, I wrote boundaries. I will give you money. I, I will buy your groceries, but I won't give you money. Right. I will drive you here, but you can't borrow my car. Right. I, you know, I will not pay your rent. I, I mean, I, and that sounds so juvenile, but it, you wouldn't, um, you couldn't imagine the burden that's lifted off your shoulders when you write down something and you say it out loud and you're, you are, you know, committed to doing it. Now, did you yeah. tell her your boundaries? I did. I did. I, I think did. that's an important part that a lot of people miss is we create the boundaries that we're going to stick to. Yes. But we don't share it. We don't tell right. the person what right. our boundaries are. So you're triggered repeatedly and you're trying to stick to your boundaries they don't know what the heck is happening they think you hate them or right. they're wondering what they did yeah. and i think that's where it's so scary is yeah. to share the boundaries you've set with the person you set them for so how did you approach that right you're absolutely right and the other piece of it is um that you will not bend if there are consequences. Um, and so, you know, there were times I, I, I said, I, I will not bail you out of jail. Don't have them call me. Right. They would call me. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had to not go because yeah. if I didn't follow through, it's over. With what I, it's over. It's yeah. over. No, nothing I said then means anything. Or it's, I, it's like, a, it's like a child. It's like when you tell a child, no, and then they come back and then they come back and they come back and you give in. Well, now they know it's only four times to know. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, no so that's the best way that I can explain it is that yeah. you have to follow through. You have to live it because the, the first time you violate it, no matter how minor it might seem, it is a slippery slope down that yeah. hill. And, right. um, and you're right back to where you started from. And you can really only do it once. Right. And then that's the hard part because you got to be ready to do it when you say you're going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You really got to, you got to stick to it. Um, tell us and the viewers um, about your book, about the Addiction Foundation. Give us a little bit of information here on, um, you know, where we can go to learn more about um, what we've talked about here today. Um, you know, where can people go to find out information about um, addiction being a disease of the brain, you know, maybe you can cite some um, some some science that we can look into 
and then uh, tell us how to stay connected with you and about the work that you're doing. Sure, sure. First, I will show you my book. Um, yeah. You asked about my relationship with my mother, so I wanted to, I wanted to share a little bit with you, um, and and tell you where I'm at today with that. Please, but yeah. I just like to read a paragraph or two from the book that talks about this. Um, and if I cry, I apologize in advance. But oh, <laughs> you're with you're amongst beautiful disasters. We cry all the time. <laughs> For me, the worst thing of this is always simply wanting a mother wishing she looked at me the way I look at my son. I have tried so many ways to handle this life that we've been dealt. The cycle of torment has made for a mother-daughter relationship that has mutual love out of obligation, not adoration. I know her affliction will cause her demise, but before it does, she will continue her very way lo long way down. I think about the day that I will learn of her death, and I wonder if it is wrong that I think I will feel relief. Mm -hmm. I am not even so sure that I will be sad for her or for me. If she were a martyr for something, it would all make sense. But agony that she lives makes no sense to me. Oftentimes, the sadness I felt has been for the life that she has missed. I am sorry that you are so sad. I am sorry you couldn't find your way. Um, and I will let you know that my mother passed away about four years ago. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, you know, I think that the really beautiful thing about that is that every year that goes by, I feel um, a little bit more grateful about the lessons that I learned simply from loving her. Yeah. Because it has taught me how to look at life in very different ways and how to help other people. And it's my goal to use that experience to help others. And so that leads into, you know, your, your question about the Addiction Foundation, about my publications yeah. and all of those things. And my, my journey continues. Um, this is not a done deal for me. I've right. not the, I've not reached the ultimate answer, but the, the things that you do with the stuff that you learn hopefully can help people reach things quicker than you, right, right. which is what my goal is. I don't yeah. want somebody to have to go through 45 years yeah, right. to try and figure this out. I want them yeah. to get there faster so they can be healthier sooner. Right. And that's really, you know, the purpose of, of my book. Um, it's called Growing Up Old, Child of an Addict. It's sort of the chronicle of my journey. And it's um, really just used to demonstrate that it's okay to go through the feelings that you go through. Those feelings are legitimate feelings and you need to use them to your advantage. Um, and as my mother was sick, um, she suffered, you know, for a couple of years before she passed away, but together we built um, what the Addiction Foundation would be. Oh, wow. um, and so that was an interesting process because she, she was angry and fascinated by the whole right. concept. And, um, you know, she believed that it was important for me to be able to help other people that were living um, in a life that they loved somebody who was addicted. She right. wanted to sure that in some way her life had value yeah. and um, and that's you know what we try to do at the addiction foundation we, we do a variety of things but largely it's education um, the sharing of information getting the right articles posted or are you know distributed when right. somebody has a question or, or needs help uh, a lot of what we're doing right now is is directly associated with children who have lost parents um, to addiction. So they might be young children um, right. that are going into the foster care system or um, are going into homes now with their grandparents and their grandparents right. aren't prepared to. to sure. Care. Right. That's a, a portion of what we do. And the other portion that we do are, um, you know, financially supporting individuals that are trying to be um, sustainably in recovery. Right. So uh, whether it is through Vivitrol shots that they can't afford, you know, things that, um, you know, make it really hard for somebody to to live a life that they want to live. Relocation, you know, yeah. um, rent, sure. <laughs> you know, um, uh, helping them build a contract with um, 
a landlord because a landlord might not want to rent to somebody that's coming out of rehab. Sure. But what does that contract look like? And so those are the kind of things that, that we do through the Addiction Foundation. Uh, but I, I think some of the most important stuff really is connecting people uh, that share some of the same um, afflictions, some of the mm-hmm. same uh, concerns and fears. It's mm-hmm. horrible to feel like you're alone. Right. In the world. And, and it's horrible to be embarrassed about your family's situation. Right. And many people live that way. Um, and if we can bond together and help each other, I think that's what our purpose is. Oh, that's fantastic. Going back to the book, where could we get your book? The book can um, be purchased through the Addiction Foundation website, and I think you have that link. And um, yes, I'll and post it in that would be um, great in, in the thread. I absolutely will. Okay, and that's um, it's yes, I have the site. Okay, okay. Hopefully, I have it right. <laughs> I'll double check. <laughs> it's it in the you. back of the book if you have a copy. I think there's a link in the back of the book if you. Have okay, the yeah. perfect, fantastic. Yep. Um, thank you so much for being willing to be open about such a debatable topic. You know, there's so many theories, there's, um, there's just so many ideas about it. Um, you know, people kind of attach to what they feel is right for them. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that whatsoever, but we sure do value your, um, you know, your expertise and your thoughts on this very important topic. And we're just so grateful that you shared your time and your story with us. Um, I, I'll end with this because I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, but when you were reading the excerpt from your book about, I'm not sure that I'll be sad right. when you pass away. You know, it's a very powerful statement. And it's something that I know a lot of us children of addicts or spouses of addicts or parents of addicts or anything of addicts think about, but we might not say. Right. Um, Trust me, that was hard to write. <laughs> yeah, I'm <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah. I, I had that thought when, you know, when I was younger and the relationship was so strained that it was like, it would be like a stranger passing away. I mean, I don't know this version of this person, so I don't know that I'm going to be sad. And I wasn't. Yeah. You know, he, he, he got clean and sober. Um, and then he was diagnosed with cancer and his cancer, uh, killed him really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, but a very interesting thing happened to me and I found so much understanding and forgiveness after he passed away. Yeah. I was able to work through so much after he passed than I could while he was still here. I don't understand it exactly, but it was almost like I I was released from burden, guilt, shame, question, and I was free to just focus on understanding and forgiving. And with, you know, do I wish I was able to do that and have a relationship with him while he was alive? Sure. That that wasn't in the cards for me. Um, But I really identify with you in in that excerpt from your book because um, I, I was able to love him more after he passed and understand him more after he passed and forgive him. And I will say without a shadow of a doubt, I have a better, healthier relationship with him in his death than I did with him in his life. So very well said, very it is well possible. Said. It, it, it's, it's, it's a bizarre thing to talk about. Like you only understand it if you've kind of gone through it. I think you're right. But for anybody who's having those thoughts of gosh you know you know am i even going to be sad this is it there's there's some comfort that comes if that inevitable day shows up um and you still are able to have a relationship it's just spiritual and not physical that's right that's right yeah. Beautiful. So, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for, for, for writing my thoughts. And your <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure a lot of us share it. So, um, again, thank you so much for being here. Um, please join, um, or like the beautiful disaster clothing Facebook page so that you can interact with some of the amazing tribe members that are commenting and have questions for you. You know, if you have time to, pop in and answer a few questions on the Facebook page. We would love that. 
And to everybody out there, I will post the link to uh, Melissa's book and to the addiction recovery, I'm sorry, the Addiction Foundation in the comments as soon as this broadcast is over. So Melissa, again, thank you so much for being with us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Have a wonderful day. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.